Hello, and welcome to Cooperative Vermont. I'm Matt Kropp. I'm Julia Curry. Um, and today we'll be interviewing uh, Christine Hallquist, who is uh, the former CEO of the uh, Vermont Electric Co-op and is also currently running for governor. Um, so last time we sat down together, it was co-op month, and I was um, on, a, on, the, on a panel talking about worker co-ops, and Julia was on a panel talking about housing cooperatives and food co-ops. And, uh, and Christine was representing the, the electric co-op perspective. Um, so a lot has changed since last October. So Christine, do you want to start off talking a little bit about you know, why you chose to leave VEC and make this run for, uh, for governor? Sure. I, um, yeah, yeah, I'm running, for, I'm running uh, for governor. And uh, I was the CEO of Vermont Electric Co-op from 2005 through, through March of this year. And uh, it, I really loved that job. And our focus was to uh, demonstrate the electric grid could solve climate change. When I left, we were 96% carbon free. We were offering incentives for people to move away from fossil fuel heating, cooling, and transportation. And we did that without a rate increase for five years, essentially proving you can solve climate change and it does not need to cost more money. And I will tell you, there's so much I loved about this job. And, I would, we, and, and I'll just give one example. As I went around the country work, working on climate issues, I'd have other utility managers say to me, investor-owned utilities, are you having a hard time getting employees? No, I said, we get great employees. You know, young engineers who come for the mission. They really are mission-oriented. Um, so it's, uh, it was exciting, but I, uh, I will tell you the reason I run probably ties to the fact that, that I was leading a cooperative. You, you really have to be a collaborative leader to lead a cooperative. You can't be, you can't be command and control. Uh, command, and, you, command and control is great during fires and power outages, but the rest of the time you, you've got to be a collaborative leader. And, and co-op employees won't put anything, will, will not put up with anything but a collaborative leader. Um, and um, what I, when I saw in 2016 after the election, the division that started to creep into our country and in our, into our state, I realized I want to run for governor and bring um, collaborative, uh, collaborative, collaboration back to the state of Vermont. I've always believed that Vermonters pull together to do big things, but with all this division that's coming in, um, I think we can really get back to a very shoulder-to-shoulder uh, -shoulder philosophy of solving problems. So do you want to sort of give us a little bit of the, the background of how you, you know, what your career was that kind of led you into this role and, um, and kind of the, what the, the the trajectory looked like while you were at the Vermont Electric Co-op? Sure. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I have a two-year associate's degree in, in, uh, in uh, computers, essentially. And I, I got that degree at a time when it was very valuable, um, which it may be valuable today, but at that time we were really a hard, hard time getting folks. So the, uh, the computer companies were going around uh, recruiting at the campuses. And my father was being transferred from GE Syracuse to GE Burlington. And, I, and, I, and IBM came to our campus, and I decided to go work for IBM. So I really started out on the factory floor. And, um, but my roommate worked for Digital Equipment Corporation. And, um, and Digital was a young startup. And it was a great, you know, great computer company, a lot of fun. So he kept telling me, come work for them. And I finally went to work for them and quickly, um, quickly went up the, the, the career ladder, partially because it was a young company. But also because I, I realized I used to go to work with my father, who was a great engineer. You know, and when I was a, when I was in high school, I was making circuit boards and learning from hmm. my dad. So when I got there, they're like, <laughs> "We, you, we're making you an engineer." So I became the engineer on power systems. And uh, after a few years, I, I uh, got the opportunity to become the power systems manager of power system manufacturing, which was was a pretty important role. And I was feeling pretty excited, um, but my my boss came to me and told me um, a month after I got the job that, w that we can get these power supplies for under a dollar a watt from Japan. You're a buck eighty-nine. Uh, fix that in a year, or we're going to wipe out the whole division. So of course, what I did was I picked up this little green book called the Toyota Manufacturing Process. And when I read that book, it talks all about process. It's what's known as lean manufacturing today. But that book kept referring to this the the real the real patriarch of lean manufacturing was a, an American called Dr. Edwards Deming. And he, the real important thing about this lean manufacturing is not the process itself, but the leadership. And when I read that book, um, he said some great points. 
Um, there are 14 points for leadership. One important point is drive out fear and maximize the diversity of thinking of your workforce, um, as well as avoid sloganeering and you know, be careful with what you measure, all those kind of things. So I applied that and quickly, tremendous success. Then the company asked me to do it uh, for the entire company. And then I had this great career at, as uh, the company started to, to go down the tubes in the early 90s and I wanted to stay here in Vermont. So I became a freelance consultant. So all this, I had an opportunity to work with these great companies all over the country. You know, I, I lucked out with my first gig, which was to lead a team to design a model mill, a brewery that was built in Trenton, Ohio. So, we, so designing a brewery was the first project. And then the next, and then Keebler, I went into all the Keebler cookie plants. And then I worked with Ocean Spray. And the Ocean Spray is the first co-op I, I stumbled into. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty remarkable the difference the way Ocean Spray operated versus the other companies. So it kind of caught my eye. Um, so, but over the years, I, I had a great success. At, actually, um, I went to work for uh, Honda, hired me to look at the entire process of the automobile, from how it gets conceived, designed, manufactured. So for the late 90s, I was being flown out to uh, Torrance, California for one week a month. And uh, that's, that was pretty exciting. Honda was one of the best managed companies I ever dealt with. But anyway, um, Vermont Electric Co-op hired me because they were in bankruptcy, and I gave them two days a month. And Vermont Electric Co-op was quite fascinating. It's one of these places that I fell in love with. Um, when I first walked in, because they were in bankruptcy so long, I said, wow, this is the most technologically backwards company I'd ever walked into. <laughs> so that was my initial reaction. But then as I realized these employees were running this company, these employees loved the company to the point where it almost appeared like you didn't need some, you didn't need a CEO, you know, you, 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 and so um, when I had the opportunity to become CEO or leader, I, I, you know, I realized, I started to learn about the cooperative model. So I became, I, I took over leadership of the company in 2005. Company was still on the edge of bankruptcy. State was still quite mad at it, ready to pull its certificate of public good. We um, had the highest number of outages in the state. We were the most expensive in terms of rates. Um, but an amazing, but so when I took over, first I'll say, I, I pulled the employees together, and again, I had great faith in these employees. I said, look, I, might, I, have, tr I have a ton of business experience, but I only give myself a 10% chance of success. But if we work together, we can be successful. And I also said, also, I'm gonna tell you that we're all gonna abide by the union rules. It was a union company. So, Whatever, whatever raise you get, I get. I, you know, I will get, every person in here will get, abide by the union contract. Because I knew that's what shoulder to shoulder is. Mm -hmm. um, an amazing thing happened in about, f uh, it, that was 2005. In 2010, I was invited down to the Department of Energy. I thought I was only meeting with two people. I come into this room, there's 25 people, all heads of different parts of the Department of Energy. They told us we were the most innovative utility in the nation. And oh, by the way, you know, from a rating agency standpoint, uh, and I say this, most, you know, I, I know this is a little bit in the weeds, but real important, we went from a triple B minus with a negative outlook to an A plus rating with a rating agency, which is, peop, financial people will tell you that's impossible. Christine, can you explain for people who aren't familiar who's rating what? Yeah, so what, <laughs> what, what companies, so our cooperatives we, we, was rated by the same rating agents that, rate, that rates all businesses across the world. They're called rating agencies, and they, they assign you a financial rating based on how stable and how good your business is. So the triple B minus with a negative outlook is what's called just above junk bond status. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you might as well be out of business if, you're, if you drop below triple B minus with a negative outlook. That's where we started. A plus is an outstanding rating. And that directly relates to your borrowing power. And we'll talk a little bit about this later because if you look at um, co-ops, co-ops are a great model for investing in infrastructure. But an important part of co-op is to make sure you have solid financials so you can get the capital you need to build. And we'll talk more about that later. So anyway, that, I will tell you my experience in it's the electric cooperative, I, fall, I fell in love with the cooperative model. I, you know, I was working with for-profit businesses all along. Um, but let me tell you why I felt I'm just absolutely in love with the cooperative model is because um, co a co-op is a democracy. You know, in, in the case of uh, our electric co-op, if you're a member, you have a vote. And you elect your board of directors, and we had um, seven districts, 
pretty equally numbered. Um, and we, uh, and we had f so seven district leaders and five at-large members, and they would elect these board members. The board member's job was to carry out the will of the members, and I worked for the, for the board. And, and our you know, very good board policies, point being the board has one employee, it's the CEO. And, and, uh, over the, and we run our, the, the monthly meeting is really important. I, I joke because uh, I, I, you should also know I did a lot of, I, I did a ton of work nationally, and there's, there's the uh, electric cooperatives serve 56% of the land mass of this country. There's close to 1,000 of them. And I had a national role, and I worked with a lot of the CEOs, but we had this joke in the cooperative world. It's the only place where you want a leader who's got 30 years of experience, but they only get a 30-day contract. <laughs> that, and that, you, you, know, you, know, you probably know what that means. That means you're going from board meeting to board meeting to board meeting to board meeting. <laughs> And it's really, a, I think it's a, a great, it, it really uh, screams with accountability as a leader because you know, it doesn't matter what you did last month, it's what are you doing this month and what's our future look like. So can I ask you more about that? <laughs> yeah. So um, a private, you know, either a publicly owned, um, you know, a business that's publicly traded or a lot of private businesses also have boards, mm -hmm. right? And they also may have monthly meetings or quarterly meetings. So what's, what's the difference? Oh, let me tell you, thank you for asking that question. Here's, there's a big difference here because uh, our board, they're kind of, they're, it's a non-professional board. It's elected from the membership. It's, it's, I call it a highly functioning democracy. Um, and the board members are, everybody in the organization is focused on what does the member want. And in, the, in something like the electric utility, which is a big infrastructure business, we get the opportunity to look out 30 years and make our investments. I don't, that, in a, in a for-profit world, is quarterly, quarterly focus. So the point is, you're, you're making this 30-year this plan, and you're making sure each month that it's all working. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm talking about. So in a, so in a publicly traded company, who are the who does the board represent, and who who's the accountability accountability to? In a public traded company, it's it's to the shareholders. That's where that's where the big difference is here, mm -hmm. and this is why you're going to hear me talk about how important I think cooperatives are for infrastructure, um, because especially in in the world of we're facing today with climate change, and and being having to look at the long term. The CEO in an, a for profit, and I'm generalizing, so so bear with me on that, but. But a CEO in a for-profit for is looking at their quarterly return to the shareholders. The shareholders oftentimes don't really care what the business is. Mm -hmm. They're looking for, I'm, I'm investing $100 million, you know, and I want, I want to be getting $3 million every quarter. I don't care what you're doing with it, just make sure I'm getting me that $3 million. And they may live anywhere in the world. They may live anywhere in the world and totally, they, yep. often totally removed from what the business is. Mm -hmm. This, now the flip side is, these are folks that are directly connected to their members. Mm -hmm. and, I, and it really was a pure model. Um, what I'm excited about, and, I, and I'm excited about applying this to our, to, to our statewide leadership, is that the most important thing was transparency and information. It, it was trust. It was, uh -huh. yeah, because if you violate that, violate that trust, you'll, you'll be out of there. And, and, I, and I'm going to, our job, I always, our senior leadership team was at every meeting because they were the experts. It was my, it was really my job to be a really great facilitator. Um, because, you know, I, I, would, I would have the senior leadership in their expertise area, like the chief operating officer can talk about all the poles and wires and outages. Chief financial officer can talk about how, how we're doing financially. Member services talking about how the members are seeing it. Mm -hmm. And the board would see that. And, and I will tell you, that's part of my success coming here to this co-op too, as well as bringing the entire senior leadership team to every board member, mm -hmm. board meeting. Because, and I told the, that senior leadership team, if I say something wrong in that meeting, you correct me in front of the board. Because the last thing I want to do is walk out of there with, with the wrong message. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and once the board starts to see that, they recognize that, yes, this whole organization is being transparent. So I think transparency is probably one of the most important things you can do to be a successful leader of a cooperative. Didn't that make you look weak? Oh, <laughs> thank you for asking that question. <laughs> <laughs>
On the contrary, the, the job is to pass the credit along and, and take all the grief. <laughs> I think that's the most strong leadership that you, you can have. You know, it's called accountability. You know, accountability is, is one of those things that you know it when you see it. Um, yeah, I know I think that's strength. And I'm going to tell you a story, too, because when I was uh, about um, that, that weakness in, in leadership, I was, uh, I was the, the face of this uh, Kingdom Community Wind Project where we put 21 turbines on a ridge line. It was very painful for some folks to put these turbines up, and I really learned a lot in the process. But I went to a meeting one day, and there was 123 anti-wind folks in the meeting in Albany, and they were members, and of course have to treat them with all the respect of any other member, even though they didn't like the project. One person asked me this following question. They said, what do you believe? I said, it doesn't matter what I believe. No, no, what do you believe? Tell us what you believe. It doesn't matter what I believe. What do you have, no soul? No, I have the highest ethical standard because I work for the members. I said, you know, it, that's the point I'm trying to make here. You know, if, if, if our members want to do something and I don't like it, I, it doesn't matter. I either carry it out or I leave. The good news is we're in Vermont and Vermont has nice green energy goals. <laughs> but, but that's the point. I make that point because I have very good friends all across the nation and some of these CEOs or leaders are using coal. Mm. And they're in Kentucky. And their members are, jobs are from coal. Mm -hmm. And they're ethically, they're doing the job of the CEO of that coal region CEO. Mm -hmm. And I would never judge them because of that. So on the, on the flip side of thinking about the um kind of the, the differences between what leadership looks like in a for, sort of for-profit investor-owned business versus a co-op. Um, the, the sort of other side that is, is the sort of non-profits, right, that are kind of more, you know, you know co-ops are sometimes mistakenly lumped in with non-profits as, you know, as something where, you know, okay, it doesn't exist to make a profit to pay to investors, but at the same time, it also doesn't exist to, you know, just sort of like, collect grant funds and then you know spend those funds for for a particular public good right you still your goal is to operate with a with a surplus that then can be returned to the members um, so can you talk a little bit maybe about how you feel the the co-op model and your experience of like what leadership in a co-op looks like and what is effective leadership in a co-op might contrast with what you see as kind of effective leadership in a nonprofit and in that sort of context Yes, and, and I'm going to take it back to the beginning of the electric cooperative. Um, actually, the electric cooperative started very proud of. I talk about George Aiken, uh, was our, our Vermont senator, who was kind of the leader of the electrification of rural America. And it was, and forgive me for my bias, but I think the electrification of rural America was humankind's greatest work. Um, but it, and, and let me tell you why, because back in the early '30s, um, the cities had electricity, and the rural areas did not. And it's interesting, I'll touch on it, we're, having, we're seeing the same demographics today. But back then, um, young people were fleeing to the cities. It was an aging demographic. We were seeing increasing rates of poverty. And it was because rural America didn't have electricity. And I'm talking 56% of the land mass here in our country didn't have electricity. So it was, there was a realization that the investor-owned utilities will never come to rural America because they aren't going to get that quarterly return on their investment. The, this is where the co-op model worked incredibly. Um, basically, you, the, the federal government is kind of started it with some capital. And then what happens is you, you, you build some poles and wires, and then the member buys in. They, and, and that money that the member used to buy in now is used to f build further capital for other members to buy in. So your personal capital investment goes directly into the infrastructure in order to serve others. And then they become members, their infrastructure was. So the idea is the member is kind of the shareholder. And, and when, when the cooperative uh, gets to the point where they've got all the capital they need and they're, they're servicing all the areas, then they begin to start to get a return on that investment. That goes back directly to you who made that original cap capital investment. And it correlates to the, the, the amount of your investment that you had. Um, so it makes this marvelous model where the consumer is the member and is the investor. So every, 
even, you know, to this day, all of the co-op members have an investment. So that contrasts to the other non-for-profit where you have to raise the money through grants or, or fundraising. This is a direct investment through, through the use of your electricity. Mm -hmm. And I would just, I appreciate that description because it really brings out how that is the most direct possible accountability mm -hmm. to the consumer, yes. right? I think like people who are on Facebook or on social media are coming to realize like, oh, we're kind of the product. <laughs> we're not the, yeah. those, oh, those yeah. companies are not accountable to us. Right, that's right. We're yeah. kind of their, their product um, and they're accountable to their shareholders. Right, not us. But you're saying in a co-op, you're directly. It's one and the same. The mm -hmm. consumer and, is the shareholder, is the owner. And I'm going to give you a great story that shows how this works. We, uh, when of course keeping the lights on is the number one job of, of you know of the leadership. And so whenever there's a power outage, is uh, I would be out in the field wearing my hard hat, safety glasses, and, and vest, and making sure every, everything everybody's safe and everything's going well, and interacting with the members. And um, we, we, we had this beautiful thing we did with the members. The, the uh, chief operating officer is kind of running the storm and uh, always knows where I am. And if he had a very angry member that was giving the member services a hard time during a storm, hey, would you stop by uh, Joe Schmo's house here? Because they're very angry. So I'd knock on the door. They'd open the door and they're like, who the heck are you? <laughs> I'm the CEO. Oh my gosh, come in, why are you here? I said, because I hear you're angry and, and I'd like to hear your concerns. That's the direct accountability. That's pretty direct. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we've talked a lot about sort of the positives of the co-op structure, but, you know, I guess sort of two related questions would be kind of both around, first of all, like, how do you see the, the you know, you've talked, touched a little bit on this, but how do you see the sort of leadership competencies that, that are required to be a good co-op leader sort of transferring to, to government, government you know, what do you think does or doesn't transfer? But also sort of what are sort of, do you see as the kind of like pain points or hard parts of co-op, of kind of co-op operations and leadership? Because it's not all roses for sure. Yeah, I, I will tell you, I, I, I call myself a recovering engineer. And, and if you look at when I started the co-op, the most important thing I had to learn was patience and language. You know, because you're, you can't run a cooperative with a traditional CEO leadership style. You'll fail. People, people you know, the, the employees are so committed to the members, they aren't gonna listen to you. They're working for the members. They're not working for the CEO. Now, so you have to compel people, probably just like democracy, right? You, people say, oh, ask me this question. Oh, who don't understand co-ops? They say, Oh, well, you know, you could just tell people to do things. Oh, I got news for you. You, you don't tell people in a co-op to do things. They're working for the member. We're all working for the member. So when you're trying to create a vision, a long-term vision, you gotta go out and sell that vision. And, and you have to learn that communication is not the words I say. It's what you understand when I leave you. So language becomes very important. So if I look at my evolution as a leader from 2005 to 2018, it's re communication is probably one of the most important things that's evolved for me. Um, so I see that as directly translatable to leadership at, at the statewide level. Um, now, what's the biggest problem? Well, democracies can be really frustrating because just as I said before, you, you, you can't necessarily tell people what to do. You've got to create a compelling vision and excitement well, if you don't do that, things aren't going to happen. <laughs> and, if, and you really have to learn to really discipline your emotions. Mm -hmm. Because the, the thing I've seen that the worst thing you can do is lose control. I've seen this happen. Because if you, if you get angry and you, and you chew somebody out and you say some things you didn't regret, that you're going to regret, first of all, it's going to get around. Secondly, people are going to not be so straight with you and honest with you. Um, and I, that's, I would tell you, when I see people come into lead cops, and I work with them all over the nation, um, the, the failure happens when basically they, they lose emotional control. Mm -hmm. So how did, you, um, how did you strengthen that ability? 
Well, now we're getting to some real deep things, but, but uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what, and, and, I, and so I work with, I, I work with other um, um, for-profit CEOs, and I, I, I don't care who you are, this is true. If you're a leader, you have to continue to work on yourself because you're, you're gonna limit the growth of your company. So that applies wherever you go, but it especially applies in, in uh, the co-op world. So I will tell you, um, my evolution as a person included counseling a re on a regular basis. And I, you know, and, I, and, and I think that's the most important thing you can do. You, you have to grow as a leader and learn w if I did, you know, I'm not saying I was perfect, you know, I, 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 I got angry at times, but, you, but that anger is, is gonna get, get in the way of your progress. So you have to understand where that comes from and be able to deal with that. Because the truth of the matter is, we, you know, it is, it, we have positive visions and it's exciting. And yeah, things can be frustrating, but we gotta understand why, why are you reacting this way? So speaking of positive visions, you know, uh, perhaps as we kind of like wrap up the, the conversation, it'd be great to hear kind of your thoughts about What's your vision if you are elected governor for, you know, economic development? Where kind of these sorts of broad-based, you know, capital ownership structures like cooperatives, like employee stock ownership plans, things like that, sort of fit into that vision? And and you know, you've also been talking a fair amount about this rural broadband, um, and so kind of like how that fits into the puzzle as well. Well, that that goes back to what I talked about. Remember that I talked about in the '30s, people, the young people were fleeing to the cities, an aging demographic. Um, and increasing rates of poverty, we're seeing that same thing happen all across rural America today. Um, and, and today we're facing the exact same thing, it's called the digital divide. Uh, cities have, um, cities have uh, high speed access. And when I talk about high speed access, I'll, I'll just give you a number, 70 megabits per second is the average. Well, for 60% of Vermont, they're lucky if they can get 10, and for 20% of Vermont, they, they don't get any, it's all rural Vermont. Um, so, the, connecting every home and business with fiber is the most critical thing we can do to grow for a lot. And I, and I will do that as a leader. And that gets back to the cooperative model. Because one of the cooperative principles, I think it's cooperative principle number six, is cooperation amongst cooperatives. And, and we, we had a, close to a thousand cooperatives nationwide in, the electric, uh, in, the, in our serving, serving electricity. And all of us were focused on this problem of the digital divide. Mm. So we came up with a model, and it's been carried out in areas a third the density of Vermont. It's actually being done today, where we connected every home and business with fiber successfully and changed that demographics. So I'm taking that learning from Cooperation Much Cooperative, applying it to Vermont, and the infrastructure would be built out using the existing infrastructure, using uh, running fiber to every home and business, and the responsibility of the utility ends at the home. At that point, it, it's open access for everybody. So very, and of course, in, in the cooperative models, it'll be done as part of the cooperative infrastructure. 